This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, in our previous lecture together, we saw how it was that we would determine the assessable benefit in relation to the provision of a motor car by an employer to an employee. A car then that they would have both business and private use thereof. And the benefit that we computed, of course, demanded that we pick up from the question, it would always be given to us, what was the list price? We would have to work out, of course, an annual benefit, so we need to know whether or not that car had been made available for the entirety of the tax year, otherwise we time a portion. But the key calculation, or even just plain look up in your rates and allowances page, the key issue then, the work for you to do, is to establish what percentage to apply to that list price. And the result that you got establish what the assessment would be for that tax year, not just in relation to the fact here is a car that was bought by the employer and is now made available for the private use of the employee. It would also cover all running costs except one as regards the use of that car by the employee. The exception is car fuel, which we'll deal with here in this note that you can see on your screen now. But do please understand that any other costs like maintenance and repair costs, etc., all of those are not separately assessable. They're all dealt with under the umbrella of that car benefit that we computed last time. So don't get tempted in a question where it tells you about the car, all the stuff we needed to establish the car benefit. And it also then added, oh, and the employer also paid a thousand pounds in terms of maintenance and repairs. That is not a separate assessable benefit. It's all included within the assessment that we have established back in the previous lecture, lecture, looking at the list price and then establishing what percentage to apply to that list price and then ensuring, as it is an annual benefit, do we charge for the whole year or not? The one exception is the fuel, where there is a separately assessable, but for you, very easily computable assessment in relation to the provision of private fuel for the employee. The car benefit, as we have said, the car benefit here also covers the running costs of the car, but does not take account of the fuel. That fuel provided for private use, if that happens, as it routinely will, then there's going to be an assessment that we need to compute. Now, I've said it's an easy calculation to do because the amount of fuel benefits is computed on a base figure of £24,600, a figure again made available on your rates and allowances page, multiplied by a figure which at this stage you'll already know, the percentage used for calculating the car benefit. So when you establish that percentage to then apply to the list price to get your car benefit, you use that self-same percentage now, but against a set number. A number, as I say, given to you in the exam, should you need it, £24,600 then. Now that fuel scale charge is reduced proportionately where private use fuel is withdrawn and not reintroduced during the tax year. So it's withdrawn permanently for the rest of that tax year. If you've only had, again, the provision of private fuel for six months, and then it's totally withdrawn, it isn't reintroduced again within the tax year, they will time a portion down, half a year's worth of assessment there. Or, of course, this is the usual case, the car has probably only been acquired part way through the tax year, so you've got to time a portion, both the car benefit and also the fuel benefit. So where the car is only given part way through the tax year or indeed withdrawn part way through that tax year. We also saw that when an employer made available a car for both business and private use there, critically of the employee, what the employer might state as a condition is that the employee is required to make a certain contribution on an annual or a monthly basis, whatever, to, to the company for the benefit of having the private use of that car. And any such 
reimbursement back to the company made by the employee was an allowable deduction in terms of the fuel, uh, sorry, the car benefit. It would be a deduction from the benefit that we had computed at that point in time. We'd be able to deduct that. What happens, therefore, if the employee is also required to make a contribution towards the private fuel that he or she has consumed during the tax year? Well, be very careful here. There is no reduction is made if the employee contributes. Notice the word here, contributes, and critically, towards the cost of petrol for private use. If he pays for all fuel used for private motoring, the charge is cancelled. So here we have an all or nothing situation. If the employer is paying for any part of that private fuel, however small or great, any part of the private fuel, then there is a fuel benefit. How do we calculate that fuel benefit? Pick up the percentage that we've computed for the car benefit and apply it to that set figure, that base figure of £24,600. If, however, the contributions made by the employee were sufficient to cover all of his or her private mileage, then there is no provision by the employer of private fuel, and on that basis, there is no assessable benefit. But there's nothing in between. Either there is a fuel benefit or there isn't. It's not like with a car benefit where we would deduct from the assessable benefit the amount of contribution made by the employee back to the employer. Here, it is all or nothing. Right, what you've got to do now then, guys, going back to and using the answers that you got, for example, four that we did last time, now I need you to calculate the fuel benefit for Lewis, Nico, Fernando, Jensen and Sebastian. But assuming here also that Fernando pays Speed Merchants PLC £600 during 21-22 towards the cost of private fuel, although the actual cost of this fuel was £1,000. Now then, what do we do with that £600 that has been paid by, was it Fernando there, to speed merchants for the benefit of the private fuel? And the answer is, we do nothing with it. Because the key words there, as regards the contribution, was there, towards the cost of private fuel. They even made it abundantly clear that Fernando was not paying for all of his private mileage because it says that the actual cost of that fuel for private mileage was a thousand pounds. But simply seeing the words there, again, a, a, a contribution towards his total private fuel cost means that the employee is not paying for all of the private fuel. So there will be a fuel benefit. So with that in mind, go back to your answers to example four. You had established the percentage figures there. So you will be applying that to the set figure of 24,600, and that would be the fuel benefit for the tax year. But of course, make sure that that car has been made available for the entirety of the tax year, unless if you haven't, then you're going to have to do some time apportionment. But over to you guys, have a little go at that, get your calculators out, and uh, come back and we'll have a quick review through. Well, hopefully a quick and easy exercise for you here. All we had to do for each of the taxpayers concerned was to pick up what was the percentage that we computed to apply in the car benefit terms to that list price and use it again now, but applying it to, in each case, a set fixed figure in relation to the fuel benefit. And that's a base level of 24,600. So for every one of these, whether it's Lewis, Nico, Fernando, Jensen or Sebastian, it's £24,600, that should be 24600 there, that is picked up in each case. In relation to that, we then pick up, as we have already computed, the relevant percentage from working out the car benefit, which again in an exam question where you're trying to get the car benefit and the fuel benefit, you already know what that percentage is. The only thing we then discovered was, of course, that with Lewis in question, 
uh, Lewis had only had the provision of that particular car for eight months of the tax year. Therefore, as it's an annual benefit being computed here, we time a portion uh, accordingly. That fuel was not available for four out of the 12 months of the tax year. So we get eight months worth of benefit. What does that mean? Like with the car benefit, that figure is then included as part of the overall employment income assessment to include within the income tax computation. Nico, it was a full year, so the full 36% of 24-6, £8,856 was the outcome. Now you think here what that means. As I said, it becomes a part of the employment income assessment. So if, as is likely, the particular taxpayers concerned here, Nico, is a higher rate taxpayer, then this is going to cost Nico a lot of money in terms of taxation. Because that increase in assessment as a higher rate taxpayer within the higher rate tax ban is taxed at 40%. And that's going to come out to, well, something and something over 3,540% of uh, 9,000 would be, what, 3,600. So just over 3,500 towards 3,600 there would be the outcome. That is a lot of money to pay out as a tax charge in relation to the fact that the company has paid for the private use, sorry, the private fuel in relation to your motoring during the tax year. So always an exercise that an individual would have to do here if from a starting point of the employer has paid for all of the fuel inclusive of the private fuel or indeed inclusive of any part of that private fuel then it would seem sensible would it not to be able to work out what benefit would it be now to the employee to actually reimburse the employer for all of his or her private fuel and that is illustrated probably more than anything else when we deal with Fernando. So when we look at Fernando, we again have got that, as we said, should be 24,600, the uh, set base rate there, at 37% given the CO2 emissions of this particular vehicle, and that left us with an assessable benefit, a taxable benefit of over £9,000. Now, as we just saw with Nico there, if it was 9,000, 40% of 9,000 would be 3,600 pounds. It's just over 9,000, so it's more than 3,600. But 3,600 pounds plus of, ta oops, of tax to pay. If again, we're taking, again, as it will have to be the case in terms of Fernando here, that Fernando is a higher rate taxpayer. So the tax cost of the fact that the employer of Fernando is paying for some part of the private fuel, the tax cost that results from that fuel benefit is in excess of £3,600. Now, you look at the information that we're supplied with within the question. We're told that the overall private fuel cost was £1,000. And Fernando had reimbursed, had made a contribution of £600 towards that private fuel cost. So because that meant, and it is noted here, there's no reduction for the contribution made by Fernando since the cost of private fuel was not fully reimbursed by Fernando. And because Instead of paying the extra £400 back to the employer, that uh, boosting up the reimbursement from 600 to cover the full private fuel cost of £1,000, because he didn't pay that extra £400, he's ended up having to pay HMRC in excess of £3,600. Now, it's never a nice choice, is it, between shall I pay some money back to my employer, who doesn't pay me enough money anyway, or should I pay money to HMRC? Now, again, a bit of a Hobson's choice, as I say. Neither is good. But what would be best in that outcome? To pay the employer the extra £400 required to ensure that then Fernando had fully reimbursed the employer, Speed Merchants PLC, here. And therefore, 
no private fuel cost is being paid for by the employer, and therefore there would be no fuel benefit. That £9,102 would disappear from Fernando's employment income assessment. And with it, therefore, we'd be reducing that tax cost by over £3,600. So better is it not to pay the employer, much as we may do this begrudgingly, but to pay the employer an extra £400 on top of what we've already paid in order to reduce our liability to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs by over 3600 That's a in excess of £3,200 saving that you've made there by just paying the extra in relation to your private fuel so you're fully reimbursed, there is no fuel benefit. Because here, at that level, on a higher rate taxpayer, that's a hell of a big figure of taxation to be paying. So something that all employees in conjunction with the employer should be doing at the end of each tax year to ensure that they don't end up with a huge tax cost by compared to a lower actual cost of simply reimbursing the employer for the full amount of the private fuel. On to uh, Jensen now. Now, of course, because we're talking about uh, a rather more electrical car than dirty petrol or diesel type car, we had only 4%. And that meant that the assessable benefit, well, a very different number there by comparison to what has gone before, a mere £984 to include on Jensen's employment income assessment for our 21-22 tax year. Finally, with Sebastian, again, picking up the uh, base uh, level of 24,600 times the percentage rate that we computed for the car benefit, and we get the assessable benefit. In each case, there, if the employer is paying for any part of the private fuel, those figures of assessment would be included within the employment income assessment to then go on to the income tax computation for the tax year. And if we're dealing with a higher rate taxpayer, creating an increase in tax liability of 40% times that particular figure. OK, back to our notes, therefore, now. And the last couple of assessable benefits we have to deal with. You'd expect, wouldn't you, that if your employer was going to provide you with uh, a vehicle for your uh, private as well as business use, it would probably be a car. But let's say you're a bit lower down the pecking order here in terms of who gets cars. And what you have is the use of a company van or indeed heavier commercial vehicle. Now, it's unlikely you'd be taking the company lorry home for the weekend there. But if you've got a van, then you might use that van pretty much as you would use a car. It is your principal form of transport there. So what happens when a van or similar heavier commercial vehicle is made available? Here again, there are numbers to be aware of, but numbers that are given to you on your rates and allowances page. So what have we got? Where an employee uses an employer's van for journeys between home and work. Remember, journeys between home and work that's private usage. That would be a private element in terms of the use of the vehicle. And in addition to that, any other private use is insignificant, there would be no benefit. Now, if it is significant rather than insignificant, where private use is not insignificant, the tax charge is £3,500 per hour. That number, again, made available to you on your rates and allowances page. So that 3,500 is just a set figure. It doesn't matter about any other characteristics in terms of the van, whatever it might be, it's a set 3,500 pounds. But here, they're fairly lenient. Again, somebody who's got a van usually needs that for the job that they are doing. And therefore, they say, OK, we're not going to worry about home to work. In ordinary, that would be private. But if that plus only a little bit of other use of that vehicle is actually private, then we won't assess at all. Now, again, you get into a subjectivity there. That's not going to happen in terms of your exam question. They're going to tell you. They're going to use words like significant or insignificant there to determine whether there is or whether there is not 
that three and a half thousand pounds. And again, of course, per annum, it's an annual benefit. If you've only had the use of the van for half of the year, only half of that would be the assessment. Now that covers the provision of the vehicle itself, but then, like with cars, an additional charge is made for fuel, provided for unrestricted private use, and that amount is equal to £669 per annum. Again, no reference here to any other details. It is just, again, if it's unrestricted private use, it's £669 as the assessable benefit. And again, both the 3500 and the 669 available on your rates and allowances page. As we've intimated, both benefits would be time apportioned if the van was unavailable to the employee during any part of the tax year. The usual provision, of course, there is that you've only been provided with it for so many months of the tax year. But like with the situation on cars, if it was unavailable for 30 days or more, then there's a time apportionment in relation to that annual benefit, benefits here indeed. Okay, and the last one, beneficial loans. Now, again, here, there's a, a bit of work for you to do in terms of, you've got to use your calculator a lot. Because what we're talking about in terms of a beneficial loan, a loan. So, the employer has provided a loan to the employee. And in relation to that loan, it is beneficial because either it might be interest free or interest is being charged at a lower rate than the official rate of interest. The figure which you'll see in these notes is for our 21-22 tax year, 2%. That is also a figure that is again on your rates and allowances page. So that is given to you. So if therefore either interest free or if there's a small amount of interest being paid by the employee back to the employer for the benefit of having this loan, if that actual interest payment is less than 2%, then there is an assessment to establish there. But as we'll discover, there may not actually be in real life any need to do any calculation of assessment, because that will depend upon the level of loan. Now, of course, in any exam question you get where the computation is going to be required will be above that so-called de minimis limit, and therefore there will be a need to compute the assessable benefit. And that's where your calculator has to work overtime to establish this figure. But a beneficial loan, of course, one made to an employee below the official rate of interest, which again is 2% for our 21-22 tax year. The benefit that is assessable is the interest on the loan at the official rate, i.e. 2%, less any interest actually paid by the employee. If the employee is paying 2% or more in relation to that loan, there is no assessable benefit. End of story, it is exempt. There will also be no assessable benefit if the loans do not exceed £10,000 in total, if there's more than one of them, at any time in the tax year. So as long as at no date within the tax year have the total amount of loans, so you can't just have, oh, I'll borrow 9,000, I'll borrow 9,000, I'll borrow 9,000. Oh, they're all less than 10,000. So that's exempt, isn't it? No, it isn't. We're talking about the total level of loans. So if at no date within the tax year have your total loans exceeded their 10,000 pounds, in total, the total loans, then there's no assessable benefit. Now, again, it is most likely in an exam question that they're going to set you one way you've got to do the calculations, so you're going to find you're above that. But be aware of that de minimis level of £10,000. The benefit is calculated, the bit you've got to do, ah, unfortunately for you, there are two ways by which it may be computed. A much quicker and easier average method, it's known, or the accurate or sometimes referred to as strict method here. The average method, as I've said, is somewhat easier. This uses the loan outstanding at the beginning and the end of the tax year, assuming, of course, that the loan has been outstanding throughout the tax year. We take the loan at the start of the tax year, the 6th of April. What was the loan at the end? 
add the two of them together and take an average, so divide by two. So the opening loan, the closing loan, divide by two, that's the average loan. And on that, we charge the 2%, the official rate of interest, and compare it with, if there is any, any interest that has actually been paid by the employee, or that was payable by the employee to the employer. If the loan is taken out or paid back during the tax year, that date is used instead of the beginning or end of the tax year. So if at the start of the tax year, therefore, the loan outstanding was, say, £30,000, and then we had uh, £10,000 repaid, so it's now down to £20,000, and then halfway through the tax year after that, the remaining £20,000, that was repaid in full. So the loan was fully repaid. So we had 30000 at the start of the tax year, an initial £10,000 repayment a few months after the start of the tax year, and then that left 20000 and halfway through the tax year, that final £20,000, that then was repaid. So what you do not do here is to say, well, the opening loan was 30000 and the closing loan was zero because we repaid it during the year. So we'll do the assessment, shall we, on 30000 plus zero. No, you don't. What was the level of the loan at the point at which it was repaid? We started with 30000 we repaid 10 that left 20 so £20,000 was the level of loan at which point the amount was repaid. And on that basis, therefore, 30 plus 20, 50 divided by 2, that would be the calculation. So that date is used instead of the beginning or end of the tax year. The accurate method, this calculates the benefit day by day. For us, of course, our time apportionments will be to the nearest month. So for us, month by month. On the balance that was actually outstanding. So we're going to compare, therefore, on an actual basis, how many months, like with my example, how many months was it 30,000? How many months was it 20,000? And we'll compare for those number of months for which we had those different levels of low. This is only an issue where we've had repayments during that uh, tax year. But we will compare, right, for that many months at that level of load, what's the official rate? 2%. And what, if anything, is the interest actually being uh, paid? And the difference between the two, that is the assessable benefit, as we'll see in a moment. So either then the taxpayer or HMRC can decide to use the accurate method. Well, the default setting is the average method. But if when you do the actual method, we discovered that we had uh, a lower amount of assessment there, then the taxpayer would quite reasonably and quite sensibly elect to go for the accurate method. So the employee, the individual, can say, I want the actual method instead of taking the average method. Now that, of course, is because the actual will give rise to a lower figure in that situation. And therefore, <laughs> you'd be mad not to. I want to be assessed on the smaller number and therefore save tax thereon. But of course, HMRC also have the ability to go with actual instead of average. That, of course, we'd say, and obviously there would be where the actual gives a higher figure of assessment than the average method would do. Now, they don't always exercise this. There would only be an exercise of that option to go for the strict, the accurate method by HMRC if they saw that the taxpayer was basically deliberately trying to reduce the assessable benefit. Now, they've got to have this option. Otherwise, think what you can do. You have £30,000 outstanding loan at the beginning of the tax year. And then, for 11 months or for 360 days, for example, of that tax year, there's no repayments. And then, in conjunction with your employer and with a friend, you borrow £30,000 off your friend. 
you then repay that loan to the company so that at the end of the tax year, guess what? The loan level is zero. So on the average method, what would you do? 30,000 plus zero. Uh, that therefore is 30,000 divided by two, you'd have an average loan of 15,000. And on that figure, you'd then work the assessable benefit, looking at what the official rate of interest is compared to any interest, if there's been any, that's actually been paid. And what would you then do? On the 6th or 7th of April, into the next tax year, you take out the loan again from the employer and repay your mate the £30,000. So that is, just, there's no way that HMRC are going to let you get away with that. So HMRC would say, that, no, you're deliberately here trying to reduce the assessment in terms of the very specific timing of these repayments. And obviously, subsequently taking money out again is a clear indication that we're deliberately perverting these rules for taxation benefit. So all HMRC would do is they say, OK, what we'll do, therefore, so you had £30,000 loan for 364 days or 360 days. So we'll, for 360 days of the ta tax year, work the assessable benefit on 30000 at 2%. And then for one day, two days, four days, five, six days, whatever it might be, we'll do it on the zero. So it stops, therefore, sort of deliberate action to pervert what would otherwise be the basis of computing the assessment. Normally, of course, in situations in real life, we will be able to use the average basis, even though repayments are being made. Because normally what would happen if the employer has been kind enough to lend you some money, for whatever reason, and there is an assessment there on, then you are going to probably have to repay month by month through salary deduction the amount that you owe to the employer. So the repayments will be a set amount each month. Well, we're not going to do 12 different calculations for 12 different levels of loan. Just be the average basis there that we would use without a doubt. But where these one-off repayments have occurred, such as you'll see in exam question, that's where the accurate method may indeed be used. The taxpayer can always exercise their right to do it, and will do so if it's a lower amount of assessment that arises. HMRC will go for a higher amount, where usually there's some significance in terms of the difference between the two, and it's very clear that there's deliberate action being taken by the taxpayer to uh, take advantage of that particular rule. Right, now then, let's see if we can do the numbers. So I hope you've got your uh, calculator warmed up here. You're going to need that. So what have we got to do? We've got to calculate the taxable benefit for 21-22 under, obviously here, the average basis, and then a little bit more time-consuming, the accurate method. Official rate of interest, as given on your rates and allowances page in the exam, is 2%. So what are we told about here? Our hero, Jack, was given a loan of 35,000 by the employer on the 31st of March 2021. So just before the start of the tax year. Interest is payable by Jack on the loan at 1% per annum. Now, of course, that means that's only half of the official rate of interest. So there would be an assessable benefit to compute. But look what happens. On the 1st of June 21, Jack repaid £5,000. So we had a £30,000 loan outstanding for, we've got there, April, May for two twelfths, two months within the tax year. And then we go down to repay 5000 sorry, we've got 35000 I beg your pardon, silly me, 35000 the original amount of loan outstanding for the first two months. Then the repayment of 5000 is made on the 1st of June. So therefore, we drop to 30000 But is that for the rest of the tax year now, after repaying £5,000 on the 1st of June? No. On the 1st of December 21, a further 15000 
So we've repaid their 15 out of that 30,000. So that happened on the 1st of December. It dropped to 30,000 on the 1st of June. So the £30,000 level of loan was in play for six months within the tax year. We've then repaid 15,000. So now the level of loan is 15,000 pounds. The remaining 15,000 was still outstanding at the 5th of April, the end of the tax year. And it doesn't matter here that what the earnings, the other employment income is for Jack. Don't worry about that. So we've had two months at 35,000, six months at 30, from 1st of December through to the end of tax year, apportionments to the nearest month, another four months, therefore, at £15,000. Now, we need that information because, of course, we're going to have to work out how much interest has actually been paid. Whether we are going to go with the average method or the strict method, you need to know what actual interest was paid because our hero, Jack, was paying at 1%. In relation to the interest, uh, sorry, the loan outstanding was required to pay the employer interest at a rate of 1%. So if you do those calculations, that will tell you how much interest has actually been paid. And whether you use the average method or the strict method, whatever calculation you get, therefore, of what the assessable benefit at 2%, the official rate of interest, would be, you're going to deduct, you're going to reduce it by the amount of interest actually paid. So that interest actually paid is relevant in both computations. But in relation to the average method, then how much a loan was outstanding at the beginning of the tax year, that opening loan was 35,000, plus how much was the loan at the end of the tax year, the remaining 15,000 still outstanding at that date. And on the average, therefore, opening plus closing divide by two. And that therefore would give you your average loan. And that average loan, you could then assess at 2% and deduct from it the 1% payments that all of these calculations here came up to. When you use the strict method, you don't just say 35 plus 15. What would that be? That would be 50,000 divided by 2 is 25,000. What we do is to work out on 35,000 for two months at 2% plus 30,000 for six months at 2%, plus 15,000 for four months at 2%, what does that come to? And again, deduct whatever those actual interest payments come to, which is based at 1%. Okay. You have a go at the numbers now, and we will meet again when you've done that and you've looked at the model answer. Pause at the moment, therefore, and I'll see you again in a moment's time. OK, let's check our numbers of okay, rounding to the newest pound here. I think we've done or take it up or down. Doesn't really matter. But what have we got with the average method? First of all, to get the amount of the assessable benefit before deducting any interest that was actually paid on the average method. What was the opening loan? 35. What was it at the end of the tax year? 15 to get the average of those two points divide by two and then multiply by 2%, the official rate of interest. And compare with that how much interest was actually paid. And here's the calculations for it. And it's as we saw, for two months of the tax year, the first two months there was 35,000 amount of loan, the amount at the beginning of the tax year, and that lasted for two months. We then repaid 5,000 pounds, so it dropped to 30,000 pounds. And that was for six months before then we further, or Jack here, further repaid another 15, dropping the loan to 15,000, which again, at interest actually being paid at 1% on the outstanding figure. That was for four months. So we get, therefore, a figure of some £258. That 258 is taken away from what the uh, average method assessment at 2% would bring you. And that means that we'd be talking about an assessable benefit in relation to the beneficial loan of £304 to include within the employment income assessment of the taxpayer. We now look at the accurate method. 
And we do as we've just done for the actual interest payments, looking at the two months, the six months, the four months, where the loan outstanding was 35, 30 or 15, and computing each of those figures at 2% for the relevant number of two, four or six months, as the case may be. Get the figure, take out as ever the amount of interest actually paid, and that shows us that the number is 259. By comparison there to the average method, which gave you 304. So here is a situation where the strict or accurate method gives a lower assessment, and therefore you'd assume that the taxpayer would make that election to go for the accurate method, and therefore be assessed on £259 instead of £304. OK, that brings to an end the exercises here in relation to the assessable benefits. The remaining part of this lecture simply talks about and discusses the pay-as-you-earn system, the PAYE. That's administration as to how that system is administered by the employer with what their duties are and things that they have to do. That, along with Chapter 15 on the Administration System for Personal Taxes, and Chapter 23, I think it is, which is the Admin System for Corporate Tax, those are self-study because they basically learn it. I can't learn it for you. Only you can do that for yourself. There's little in the way of doing exercises. Where there are, I will add in bits and talk to you through those. But they're learning exercises and you need to learn it. Again, I would say to you, if this is at the moment you are working gradually through each of these chapters, don't at this point now spend time looking at the PAYE system. Move on. Get through all of the doing parts of the taxes in terms of the chapters that we have here. Again, after this, move on. When you get to chapter 15, don't bother with it to begin with, move on. When you get to chapter 23, don't bother with it to begin with, move on. And then practice all of the computational uh, work that you need to do for all of the personal taxes and corporate tax. Do that first of all. And then, as it's a short-term memory thing, closer to exam date, when you're comfortable with all the doing things, the computations that need to be done, then spend a little bit of time looking at the administration issues there. That would be my advice. Again, there will be admin questions coming up in the objective testing part, the section A part, rather. Um, again, and it's stuff that needs to be known. But if this is now two months, three months, four months before the time you take the exam, there's a little point in trying to memorise and learn that admin stuff now, because you'll have forgotten it by the time the examination comes around. So better, therefore, you do the job once, and you, you rely on your short-term memory, which this really is, and do it closer to exam date. But only once. You practice, practice, practiced, having learned, studied, learned, studied all of the doing things throughout the chapters available to you with these notes and lectures. OK, uh, that means we've now covered all of the components of income that may be brought into an income tax computation. We've got our next chapter that deals with the last bit of personal tax in relation to income, and it looks at pension contributions. But what I'd ask you to do before we get together to look at the pension contributions issue within the syllabus, go back to chapter two, and you saw that within chapter two, if there were gift aid payments being made, then they would be treated the same way as personal, personal pension contributions would be treated. And they came into and involved themselves with things that did go on to the income tax computation. They were not deductions on the face of the income tax computation, whether it was a gift aid payment, whether it was a personal pension contribution. But they did impact on what went on to that income tax computation in terms of how we calculate the tax and how we may indeed compute the personal allowance of the taxpayer. Remind yourself of that. From this chapter, we've seen about pension contributions either being made by an employer 
into what would be an occupational pension scheme. And also then it wouldn't be and or. If there's an occupational pension scheme, the employer has to make contributions on behalf of each employee into that pension fund. The employee may also make contributions in. And we saw what happened in terms of contributions made by the employer into such a scheme. Fantastic news, exempt benefit what the employer pays in there. What the employee does, well, on an occupational pension scheme contribution, that was an allowable deduction to go against the employment income assessment. A very different treatment for occupational pension scheme contributions as compared to personal pension contributions. So please, before next time, revise the occupational pension scheme bit, a couple of little bits in terms of ooh, what happens with employer contributions, what happens with employee contributions. And then also look back to chapter two, go to the section that deals with gift aid and personal pension contributions, and it will also reference there back to the calculation of adjusted net income when dealing with restriction of your personal allowance if your adjusted net income exceeded £100,000, where you'll see the relevance of personal pension contributions, something of course which by now you should already know from the work that you did back in Chapter 2. Okay, I look forward therefore to seeing you again in Chapter 10.